So this is lesson number 10, uh, which is titled, After Darkness, Light. And this is an expression that came uh, from the Protestant Reformation, and that's really what we're going to be looking at. Last week we looked at the pre-reformers, so John Huss and uh, men like that. Here we're looking at Luther and Calvin. These are the two major figures uh, as well as other Protestant reformers. The key passage is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which if you want to open up to it, you can, but I'm just going to read that quick. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So why is this verse about the scripture, uh, how does that tie into the Reformation? Well, out of the Reformation came the phrase sola scriptura, you know, scripture alone is the authority. So instead of the Pope and the Catholic Church having the power and the traditions of men being the authority, now this is a shift back to following the Bible. So that's what the Reformation uh, really was all about. So the timeline that I think this is in your book, uh, 1505 is when Martin Luther, and it's not Martin Luther King Jr., okay, right? You know that, right? Okay. <laughs> Two totally different people uh, in many ways, but uh, 1505, that's when Martin Luther enters the monastery, becomes a monk. 1517 is when he tacked his 95 theses to the door, uh, the church door. Uh, 1521 was the Diet of Worms, and I know what that sounds like. It has nothing to do with eating worms, or worms, or however you pronounce it in German as a town, and that's where they held basically a, a council or something like a trial for Luther, because now he's opposing the Catholic Church. He's opposing the, the greatest uh, authority in all of Europe. So the Diet of Augsburg, another type of council, was in 1530. Uh, then you shift from Martin Luther to the other great Protestant reformer, as people regard him. This is John Calvin. He writes his institutes or releases them in 1536. Calvin returns to Geneva, Switzerland, 1541. Martin Luther dies in 1546. Uh, John Knox goes to Geneva in 1556. What do we know about John Knox? There's one real uh, takeaway from John Knox. He's basically the founder of Presbyterianism. Okay. And then John Calvin dies in 1564. So that's the timeline that we're looking at for this study. So number one, introducing the Reformation. And if you have a hand up, you know, just if you have a question, comment as we go, just shoot it up high so I see it. Introducing the Reformation. From the human perspective, the 16th century Protestant Reformation was possible due to several factors. The first is what? The printing press. Uh, Johann Gutenberg's invention of the movable type printing press around 1450 meant that printed materials could be published quickly and in great quantities rather than having to be copied by hand. Information in books and pamphlets could now be mass produced. All right, so that, that is a major factor. Most people agree the Reformation couldn't have happened or at least not the way it did without the printing press. Number two, the authority and reputation of the papacy uh, declined in the 14th in 15th centuries due to issues like the papal schism. Uh, do you remember, it was last week I think we talked about how at one point there were three popes and they were all excommunicating each other. So, I mean, that would be a huge glaring issue saying that the, the Catholic Church, the whole system in Europe is broken if you have three popes. Imagine for a moment if we had three presidents in this country. We have three people claiming to be president. Of course, we've sort of had that in the past few years. I remember uh, when 
uh, Donald Trump won the election in 2016, there were those people who said, what? Not my president. Hillary is the real president. And then, of course, in 2020, it, it just got reversed. Joe Biden won, and people say, no, he didn't. And tr so we sort of have it in this country where people are starting to not recognize the authorities, right? And, and that's, a, that's a bad thing. The, the, you see that the system's starting to break down once you have that. But with the Catholic Church, it was much, much worse because they had three popes. And uh, so that's the second part that led to the Reformation. Number three, the rise of humanism or the study of the humanities. Uh, this motivated European scholars to study ancient works of literature, including early manuscripts of the Bible. And this led to the recovery of biblical Hebrew and Greek. Okay, so people were now starting to look at the Bible in the original languages at what scripture actually said as opposed to what the Catholic Church said that it said. So these are three major factors that led to the Reformation. Any comments or questions so far? Mark. I think one of the uh, <clears throat> biggest reasons for the Reformation was the sale of indulgences along with the translation of the Bible. Right. Yeah, uh, I think we talked about that last week. I'm surprised it's not mentioned here. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, the sale of indulgences was a totally corrupt system. Basically, you were buying salvation. That, that was the thought that many people had. Or the salesman would come to town, you know, and they had their sales pitch, and you could, what they would say is, hey, your loved one is in purgatory, suffering, won't you donate so much money for this indulgence to get your loved one out of purgatory? And of course, every good Catholic who believed in that stuff said, yes, of course, and they donated all this money, and Luther saw that for the corruption that it was, and that, that was definitely a major factor. Okay, so these factors set the stage for the Protestant Reformation, the 16th century revival and reform movement that dramatically impacted church history. Uh, but the true catalyst behind the Reformation was what? The power of the Word of God. As Scripture was studied in the original languages and preached in the vernacular, that is the language of the common people, the Holy Spirit used the truth of His Word to open blind eyes and awaken dead hearts. The Reformers were also committed to translating the Bible into the common languages of Europe, thanks to the printing press, uh, copies of scripture were now available to people like never before. And I think I have to mention this just because I know these people exist and I've at times been a little sympathetic to this idea that there are people, uh, typically this would be the Baptists who say, you know, the Reformation, we can see that good things happen, but I don't necessarily view myself in this line of, of Reformation uh, churches. Basically, one, one reason people uh, might quibble over, over some of these statements here uh, is they, they would look at Luther and Calvin and what they believed and taught. And your average evangelical Christian today, your average Baptist, does not believe like Martin Luther. They do not believe like John Calvin. So I'm just throwing that out there that if you've spent any time in a Baptist church, the pastor probably... I mean, there's a pretty good chance he's made comments like he's not a fan of Luther and Calvin and what they believed and taught. So you'll find all that to say this, you'll find that there are churches in particular, you know, in particular Baptist churches that they don't really consider this their heritage. OK, so take that for what it's worth. But I, I, I do think that um, something happened in its significant and we need to know about it so we're going to study it okay hopefully i didn't confuse anyone with that you understand what i'm saying any points of clarification okay all right so here's where you had to fill in the blanks the reformers themselves recognized what god's word yeah god's word as the power behind their movement consider the following quotes from martin luther so, again, Luther lived from 1483 to 1546. Here's what he said. 
All I have done is put forth, preach, and write the word of God. And apart from this, I have done nothing. It is the word that have, has done great things. I have done nothing. The word has done and achieved everything. Now, there might be a lot of things Martin Luther said and wrote that people don't like, but it's hard to disagree with this statement, right? Uh, and this is, this is the thing we're focusing on, not Luther and Calvin, and because let's face it, whether it's them or leaders today, every human being, every teacher, every pastor has some flaws or some blind spots, or maybe even is wrong about certain things. But uh, we can appreciate this. Martin Luther said, by the word, the earth has been subdued, and by the word, the church has been saved. And by the word also, it shall be re-established. Okay. Martin Luther also said the Pope, Luther, Augustine, or even an angel from heaven, these should not be masters, judges, arbiters, uh, but only witnesses, disciples, and confessors of Scripture. Nor should any doctrine be taught or heard in the church except the pure word of God, Otherwise, let the teachers and the hearers be accursed along with their doctrine. Okay, so, so far so good. You agree with these statements? Yeah, um, when a pastor on Sunday morning stands up and preaches the word, this is, should be ingrained by now that we, we're called to be good Bereans, as they say, and test everything against the word of God. So. So much as a pastor is preaching the truth, he's preaching the Word of God. And it's authoritative, not because of him, but because it's, it's God's Word. As soon as he starts going off into left field and preaching his opinion and all this nonsense that opposes the Word of God, uh, he should be, yeah, well, there's a process for this, but as Luther said, um, let the teachers and the hearers be accursed along with their doctrine, if it's false. So it all has to be tested over and against the scripture itself. Larry. Well, and, I mean, he includes himself. Right. Too, so it's not, you know, somebody up pointing at fingers of everybody else. You know, they're all wrong, but I'm right. Right. Kind of a thing. So he included himself saying it's only the word of God. Yeah. And as... We, I don't know if we're going to get to it this morning, but we're going to see that Luther and another reformer named Zwingli, they had two totally different views of the Lord's Supper. Martin Luther believed that Christ was present in the elements. Zwingli believed, like us, that it's you know, symbolic, it's a memorial. Now, both men preached <laughs> what they believed was true, and it's true, one of them has to be wrong. Like, so everybody has something that's wrong. I'm sure there's something that I believe and I'm sure there's something that you believe that's wrong. But when we're talking about the, the main issues of who Christ is, his person, his work, um, those primary issues, that's, that's what matters. Um, but at the same time, these other doctrines matter too, but like I said, there's, there's, there's no one man who is infallible. It all has to go back to the Word. Constantly going back to the Word, examining everything in light of that. All right, the Reformer's commitment, I don't think this is in your book, so I'm just going to read this. The Reformer's commitment to Scripture flowed from their conviction that Christ alone is the head of the church. Consequently, His Word is the ultimate authority over the church. The Reformation principle of sola scriptura, scripture alone, is intended to summarize their commitment to the authority and sufficiency of scripture. God's word alone is the authority that establishes what to believe and how to live. The city of Geneva was an important center during the 16th century Reformation. Here is how the reformers explain their commitment to the authority of God's word. So it should be noted, the book says, that the Reformation or the Reformers did not dismiss the value of historical councils and creeds or the writings of the church fathers, but they rightly understood that all of those things are subject to the authority of scripture and that 
uh, reference is Acts 17.11. Can someone look that up? Get a volunteer to look up Acts 17.11 and then read it? Larry, okay, we'll do that. Um, okay, so they're not throwing out creeds or councils. Uh, I know I won't mention the church because I'm not saying I have a problem with this. It's just something I, I've noticed. There's a church in the area when you walk through the front door, there's a big sign right next to the door. It says, no creed but Christ. Who's seen what I'm talking about? Nobody. Okay. Maybe it's not there anymore, but it used to be. So this church, and, and this used to be a popular statement, no creed but Christ. Typically, it would be found in Baptist churches. Um, they basically were not concerned with the creeds at all. So uh, maybe they wouldn't be completely against them. Uh, but yeah, don't talk to me about the creeds. No creed but Christ. Um, the, pro you know, the one problem with that is as soon as you say, okay, who is Christ, then you're kind of going back to what the creeds tell you. But again, the creeds have to be in line with Scripture, right? I think the creeds are valuable, but they're not put ahead of the Bible. As long as they're not put ahead of Scripture, I think there's some value to them. Yeah. And I like the verse that, that does tell us that there is one person that we can trust, and that person is the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 is the verse I'm talking about. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So just another another evidence of how important it is that we learn to hear his voice. Okay. And his voice, if if it's if it's a, a Bible verse, that is his voice. That is. All right. Uh, Acts seventeen eleven. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Okay, and these, who are the these? Bereans. The Bereans. Okay, so even the Bereans, when they had the Apostle Paul in front of them, they still were testing what he said over and against. What they knew was scripture, and of course, what was the scripture at the time? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. The Tanakh. Right. So, yeah, some people will say, well, you know, the Bible didn't come around until the fourth century. The early church didn't have a Bible. I mean, that's totally not true. They, ha they had the Old Testament. That was their Bible. Yeah, okay. It wasn't bound, leather bound in one edition. So that's irrelevant. But they had a Bible. Okay. So armed with a commitment to God and his word, the reformers boldly proclaimed the scripture in the language of the people. Reformation was the inevitable result as biblical truth confronted the unbiblical traditions of men. That, that's, that's what the Reformation did and references Mark 7, 6 through 13. I'll look that up, but... Uh, for the discussion question, it says, look at the key passage listed in the beginning of this lesson, Hebrews 4.12. What does that verse teach about the power of Scripture? Okay, so we read it, Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is powerful, living, right? What does that teach us about the power of Scripture? What do you say? It's very powerful. It's very powerful. Yep. Yep. For all time. It's for all time. Good. Anyone else? I always like the way it penetrates mm. because it gets down to the heart of the matter and to divide the soul and spirit. That's that's like comparing a knife that can cut a single hair in half. Yeah. <laughs> it's very sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could put it this way: the scripture can do what nothing else can do. Okay, uh, Mark 7, just with this statement about the traditions of men, Mark 7, 6 through 13. 
I'll just read that. Jesus answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, and of course he's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees, right? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, and the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. And he said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you keep your tradition. Of course, we talked about the last week, this last week in the sermon uh, about the commandments of men versus the word of God. Remember what was happening? They had the Korban rule and the, the commandment, the fifth commandment was honor your father and mother. But the Jews had this thing, this tradition that developed where they could dedicate so much of their money to God, which meant scribes and Pharisees got some of it. And they could say, well, because I vowed this money to God, I no longer have to take care of my parents because I don't have the money to do it because I gave it to God. So this tradition of men that developed really nullified the fifth command. So they were breaking the commandments just to keep this tradition. Okay, next we're going on to section number two, a dramatic conversion. Of course, this is speaking of Luther's conversion. In July of 1505, a 21-year-old law student was walking through the German countryside. Unexpectedly, he found himself caught in a thunderstorm. Fearing for his life, he cried out for help, not to God, but to his pat patron saint, uh, Saint Anne, he said, St. Anne, spare me, and I will become a monk. Okay. How many of you have been in a real pinch, and you've cried out to God and said, Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll do whatever. Who's done that? Yeah, a lot, a lot of people have done We've probably all done that. But uh, Luther, yeah, he didn't cry out to God. He cried out to St. Anne. Yeah, that was Catholic tradition. Like, it's like when a Catholic loses something, they pray to Saint, who's the guy who helps you find things? Saint Christopher, I don't know what it is. There's some saint who has, you know, all the saints have different jobs. And of course, that's, what is that? The Catholic Church sort of uh, absorbed the pagan tradition where there was a God for this, a God for that, a God for this, and you would pray to all these different gods in paganism. Well, the Catholic Church just kind of took that system and, and replaced the gods with the saints. So now you're praying to Saint so-and-so. And so. so Luther didn't cry out to God, which kind of shows you where he was. He's calling out to Saint Anne, who obviously can't hear him. But he says, if you spare me, Saint Anne, I will become a monk. Uh, the danger passed, but the pledge that Martin Luther made in that moment was a promise he intended to keep. He left behind the study of law, much to his father's dismay, and entered an Augustinian monastery in the city of Erfurt, located in modern Germany. Though he had escaped the threat of the thunderstorm, he continued to live under the constant threat of God's holy wrath. He felt a heavy weight of guilt pressing down on his conscience, despite his repeated efforts to assuage it. In keeping with the dominant Roman Catholic thinking of his day, Luther worked tirelessly to try and earn God's favor and pay the punishment for his sins. He performed severe acts of self-asceticism, like sleeping without blankets and fasting for long periods, which permanently damaged his health. He went to confession so often that his confessor had to tell him to stop. Luther's own assessment of this period of his life was this, if ever a monk got to heaven by monkery, I would have been that monk. I mean, Luther is one of these guys, whatever he does, he takes it to the extreme. He's all in 100%. And yeah, that was the Catholic system. Yeah, that is like Paul with uh, Judaism. Yeah, he said something similar. Of course, what's the problem with this? You know, in some ways, it's right that he felt this because he's trying to atone for his own sin. He's trying to work his way 
uh, into God's favor. And this is impossible. According to scripture, this is impossible. There's nothing you can do. It's not enough good works, enough prayers. Well, if I just pray 20, 23 hours a day, then God will accept that. None of this is going to work. Why? Because it's only Christ who can uh, die on the cross for our sins to take God's wrath for us. It's only Christ who justifies. But Luther was trying to do it himself, and he just felt that he wasn't getting anywhere. Which, in a sense, is true. He wasn't. Okay. In the midst of this struggle, Luther became fixated on the phrase, quote, the righteousness of God. All Luther could see in that statement was the perfect standard of God's righteousness. And he knew he fell, fall, uh, he fell far short of it. Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For Luther, the righteousness of God stood as a continual reminder of his own condemnation because he rightly recognized that he was not righteous. So Luther is like way off in one regard, but he's, he's right on in the other. Right? Like he understands God's righteousness and his unrighteousness, which I would argue a lot of people in you know, churches today, they don't understand. Like this is the problem. They don't understand that. Uh, but Luther did. So roughly a decade after entering the monastery, Luther, uh, Luther's despair finally began to lift. While teaching through the book of Psalms and Romans and later Galatians, this desperate monk's eyes were open to the truth of the gospel of grace. Through the study of Scripture, specifically Romans 1, 16, and 17. Can I get a volunteer to look that up and read it? Okay, Aaron. Luther, through his study of that passage, came to see that the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel is not merely the righteous standard of God, but also the righteous provision of God, in which God reckons believers as righteous by clothing them in his perfect righteousness, or in the perfect righteousness of his son. Uh, Aaron, go ahead. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay. So Martin Luther, here's his quote. Uh, here is his discovery, how he put it. At last, meditating day and night, and by the mercy of God, I gave heed to the context of the words. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed, as it is written, He who through faith is righteous shall live. Then I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. An entirely new side of the scripture opened itself to me. And I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the loathing from which before I had hated the term the righteousness of God. Thus, that verse in Paul, Romans 1.17, was for me truly the gate of paradise. Luther's decade-long struggle was characterized by frustration and despair, yet it ended with the good news of the gospel. As a sinner, he could never earn a right standing before God, but through faith he could be forgiven and clothed in Christ's righteousness. So do you understand uh, the difficulty, the way he saw the phrase, okay, the righteousness of God. God is perfect, he's holy, and I'm not. And because of that, I have no hope. I mean, that's how he viewed it before. Uh, but when he saw that the righteousness of God was obtainable, not by doing good works, it was obtainable by faith. All I have to do is put all my trust in Jesus because as of this moment, who is Luther putting his trust in? St. Anne. Anne. Ultimately, though, himself. Right? He was trying to do it himself. So once he understood the gospel that Christ paid it all, Christ does it all, it's like this weight was lifted off of his shoulders. And of course, now he's 
a regenerate Christian. Now he is saved. And when, when that happens to you, what's the next thing that you want to do? Yeah, you want to tell everybody this. You want them to see what you see. And uh, he, he tried doing that. And, you know, it, it led to the Pope wanting, wanting him dead. Because as soon as people realize this, then the Catholic, the, the stranglehold the Catholic Church has on people. And it's, it's, it's like being in a cult. It's a, it's a method of control. We control salvation. You have to get it from us and you have to do everything we say. And people are just enslaved to this system. And if they find out that Christ just gives salvation full and free, I mean, uh-oh, we're going to lose our hold on power. Now, the rebuttal will be, yeah, but if you preach that, that Christ just offers salvation full and free, then people will just say a prayer and say they believe in Jesus and then go out and live however they want. I mean, that's kind of the, the opposite side of what the Catholic Church was. It's true, people do that. But I would argue it's people who don't really understand because if God saved you, you want to worship Him. And if God saved you like that and you understand it, you want to serve Him. So it's not done out of some duty that I have to do it or else. You do it because you want to, because you have a new nature, right? All right, any comments or questions on all this, Stacy? His, his time as a monk kind of makes me think of who was shepherding him and what were the rest of them thinking and doing? Were they just doing it out of rote? Because he seems really extreme, like he took everything to you know, the topmost level. So right. his self-deprecation, uh, self-loathing, really, and whatnot, trying to attain something out of his own work that he could never attain. And mm -hmm. in that, he really, he hated, actually, you could say he hated the word because of what he was putting himself through, thinking that that's what you had to do to attain this right. ultimate righteousness. But... What was everybody else around? It makes you wonder. They yeah. must have just been just doing it out of rote or doing it out of uh, somebody, you know, dictating actions or whatnot. And was he the only one actually thinking? I, I'll call on you in one second, but I just think of maybe you've experienced this. Like you get involved uh, in, the, in a church, you get baptized, you know, you're taking your faith seriously. And your other friends and family who say they're Christians, they say, well, you're taking it a little too seriously, right? I think that's probably how they viewed Luther. Luther, on one occasion, said something, someone asked him about loving God, and he said, love God? He said, sometimes I hate God. Of course, that's, oh, well, that's horrible. Well, but that's how he felt under that system where God was just this angry judge and you, there's nothing you could do. And that's how he felt. And that's probably how some people feel today. I think we've swung in the other direction where there's no more wrath and God is just all unicorns and rainbows and everyone's happy and not talking about that other stuff. We've gone the other direction. But yeah, you can sort of understand why he would have felt that way. All right, let's finish. We just have one paragraph left. He said, Luther would later identify this as the great exchange of the gospel, of what happened to him. The righteousness of God was given to him by faith. Jesus took all of his sins, right? Gave him his righteousness. The penalty for the believer's sin was imputed or reckoned to Christ who paid that penalty on the cross. At the same time, the perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed to the believer who is declared righteous by God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. No message is more important than the good news of God's grace. No sinner is good enough to earn God's favor. All of us stand in desperate need of divine mercy. The drama surrounding Luther's conversion may be unique to him, but the recognition of personal unworthiness and the need for God's grace is something every true believer has experienced firsthand. When we reflect on the story of Luther's conversion along with the larger reformation that followed it, we simultaneously celebrate the wonder of our own testimony that we have been saved by grace, not by works, so that no one can boast. Amen. Amen.
All right, you're dismissed. Thank you.